Welcome, good morning everyone. Um, we're about to get started here, so come on in and join us. Um, so guess what, we're live, we're on the live stream right now, so um, is everyone enjoying New Orleans UE Fest so far? No? Nice. Yeah. It's been a great time so far, and uh, David and I are here. Let me introduce myself. I'm Andy Blondin. I'm the Director of Product Management for the Broadcasting Live Event Space. A lot of familiar faces in the crowd. Excited to be here with you guys today. And David, you go ahead and intro yeah. yourself. I'm David Gromick. I'm a Senior Product Specialist here with Andy. And uh, yeah, we're just excited to see so many people in the crowd so we can all nerd out over some cool new tools. Yeah, so we're here today to talk about Project Avalanche, which is a dedicated tool set for broadcast design and motion graphics. Uh, some of the goals is to bring real-time motion graphic design tools to all creators. So if you saw last year, we were uh, announced it at UE Fest 2021. Um, believe it or not, I mean, we had 30, 132,000 views on YouTube. It was super popular. Um, this all started with our connection to Rocket League and FNCS, which we'll cover a little bit of this morning. And we're gonna cover a whole suite of tools we've been building uh, for you guys. So we'll, some of that we'll cover two of the projects that we've been with ESPN, and then we are in beta right now, early access for this, which we wanna talk a little bit more about and be able to describe. But first, I'm gonna kick it off and show a little bit of some of the Rocket League uh, work that we did that started all of this. So here we go. Yeah, so that was kind of our big coming out in terms of building stuff for the broadcast world and building this eSports sample after that was an awesome way to follow that up. Um, this entire thing is a fully customizable graphics package. Uh, it's got full team-based controls, so you can kind of go in there and switch out tricodes and all that fun stuff to change the color scheme and all that. And this whole thing, though, is... Uh, in case you guys aren't kind of aware of the product, but the goal is to replace offline rendering and to start running things in real time more often. So yeah, this sample project is out there to download. You guys can play around in it and yeah, give us feedback and yeah. So another thing that's coming up uh, very soon and that we are going to be actually doing a talk about later today at about two o'clock is the Fortnite Championship Series. So there's a whole graphics package for that that we worked on in collaboration with War and Blast, a couple really awesome creative companies. So yeah, please uh, stop by and uh, we'll do a really cool session with them and just kind of talk about the process. Yeah, I believe it's 2 p.m. here. So yeah, 2 p.m. Check, <laughs> check your schedules. Yeah. So next up, um, we've been working with ESPN uh, and started a great partnership. We started working with them to do the ESPYs. Um, we did the Rose Parade and the next step was to work on this ESPYs project with them. Uh, it was a fully, the same thing, customizable graphics package. We focused a lot on the lower thirds and the full screen graphics and the in-studio elements. So being able to run this out of their control rooms in Bristol, Connecticut, and be able to you know, do the three packages. We're gonna cover a lot of the details on how we built those scenes and, and rigged those scenes along with ESPN. Uh, so they obviously have a super talented motion graphics team and keep pushing the bar in many areas. But uh, this was one of the highlights of being able to actually take something that's in beta, work closely with a partner, and be able to get a project on air again. So. And yeah, David, tell us a little yeah, bit about it. Yeah, so kind of the deliverables for this project, it was uh, pretty ambitious at the time, actually. Um, it was three complete shows, um, one including the basic, the live show that was kind of the red carpet equivalent. Um, tons of deliverables, relatively speaking. I mean, that 19 deliverables is nothing to sneeze at. And 75 total actual graphics running across seven graphics engines. So uh, yeah, there's the ability in the show to at any point switch the looks because each show had a kind of its own little bit change in the color scheme. 
and we're able to kind of co accommodate all of those things across lower thirds, full screens, and just various other studio elements that they required. Yeah. So right now, where are we at? Um, we announced last year, now we're in the beta phase. So we have a beta program running. It's a private beta only, so if you're interested, after this talk, find us, and we'll tell you how to uh, sign up for it. Uh, we have over 200 individuals in there. A lot of you are from large media companies who are using this kind of uh, tech, uh, 105 different companies. We're gonna have the next version of the beta out, hopefully in the next two to three weeks, um, and we'll be covering a bunch of that progress and details now. So top features, there's a lot. There's a lot of things that we've done uh, to be able to cover, <laughs> and so we're gonna focus on a lot of these today. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start in with a little bit of the layout and the viewports and the, and the setup. So we'll go ahead and take a look and I'll talk over these videos, but you can see that we have a dedicated layout for motion design now. So you can see you have 2D and 3D viewports. Uh, you have the ability to kind of see what's going out the camera and out the SDI feeds, but you also have a 2D canvas, which we'll be describing a little bit. But you still have full access to the 3D scenes and the camera cuts and all the, the great things that you're used to using out of the, the level editor. With the 2D uh, canvas that I was talking about here, you can see that we have things like rulers and guides. So most designers coming from other applications you want to make things pixel aligned for screen and be able to hit those design targets. So we have rulers and guides. You can see we have a mixture of lit and unlit materials where you can move those lights around. We put a lot of energy and emphasis into the world outliner. So we put in filtering systems, abilities to nest and group actors uh, more easily, so they're not necessarily alphabetically sorted. You can expand and collapse those. We have a nice layering system, so you can put everything on layers. Uh, you can solo those layers so that you can work with just those aspects of the scene. Um, and so sometimes these scenes, you know, for complex broadcast graphics, they can go very deep. You know, you can have hundreds of elements, but sometimes you wanna just solo the one element and work on it in isolation. So you can see we put a lot of energy into uh, polishing up a lot of the features there. And then very common things like being able to take and rename, a batch rename a bunch of items, uh, the ability to add a prefix, suffix, or rename things. So we've actually expanded that across the board across many areas of Unreal for assets and textures and different things. And here you can see that you can actually take a modifier, for example, add an outline to things, and then you can drag and drop in the world outliner, which is pretty nice to just copy paste from one actor to the other. And then you know, for certain things like shapes, sometimes you wanna copy the whole shape, you can copy the category and just go ahead and paste it onto another shape and copy all those properties. Yep. So as you can see, we're trying to focus on artist first and making those elements really accessible and easy to use. Um, next up, we're gonna take a look at cloners and effectors. So if you've done 3D motion graphics, you've probably are aware of cloners and effectors. Cloners uh, is a system that allows you to replicate geometry. So you can see in this example here, it's kind of a football themed. We have a series of a whole bunch of cubes in the middle that have been cloned and replicated. And you can see here that we can take those um, effectors, which, which I'm moving now, and I have three different ones, but you can move them all around to come up with different patterns. So you can see here, this is a cool shoe example. This is our twin motion shoes. Um, I'm taking the clone and making it into a sphere I'm cloning a whole bunch of these shapes, and then I can instantly play that back as though it's a, you know, a cool shoe commercial. <laughs> so it gives you a lot of flexibility. Here's how the system works. We have a whole lot of patterns. We have grids, spheres, lines, circles. You can even clone it to a mesh or a spline. Uh, you have the ability to whatever you nest and group inside of this cloner actor inside the world outliner, it will go ahead and clone. So I have a whole bunch of these small little Lego bricks. And you can see we can sort those patterns. We can do um, you know, one after the other or we can randomize them. And then effectors allow you to move and uh, position scale and rotate those that fall within that area of influence. So you can see you have an inner and outer fall off with lots of custom easing. So this is an example here that's building up like a Lego ocean, for example. So you have the ability to, to have three or four of these. You, know, you can have as many as you want, but 
Um, one of them is driving kind of the movement of the waves, and then the other one's driving the peaks. Here's an example from um, you know, Nick from Grayscale Gorilla. Had we'd been working with him, he had given us some of the models, and we're building a city out of just ten different elements. Uh, so being able to move those cloners around actually allow you to do a little bit of level building and world building uh, on the fly. So it's really fun to just quickly experiment with these things and procedurally set up and and move items about. So you can see here just a little more um, examples of being able to move those things. And then lastly, you know, you can have those inner and outer fall offs so that real Lego build on effect, just showcasing how those things work. But yeah, we'll, we'll be showing um, even a little more. That was progress this last April, um, but we'll be showing even more in a minute. So here's our uh, procedural geometry tools. Uh, we've taken a lot of the geometry scripting framework and turned those into parametric uh, models here. And you can see that there are all sorts of shapes and sizes that you can go ahead and, and bring in. And these aren't just 2D shapes. You'll see here that we have a full modifier system where you can extrude and bevel and, and those type of things. But we have covered almost all the common shapes that you would do, and you can see that we're focusing a lot on the in viewport experience, being able to drag, move these things about. So you can see you can add in like extrudes. Here we have um, you know a, the word epic, for example, that's carved and booleaned live into the background. So it's taking a piece of 3D text, converting it into the dynamic geometry, and being able to carve those elements in and being able to play that back live. Mm -hmm. Uh, here you can see we have a vector importer, so we can import SVGs, and here's just a couple. One is the Fortnite logo, the other one is just a stock element that I pulled in. Um, but you can see that these are all uh, converted into geometry, so it can be almost like vector graphics, very, very high res, so you can zoom in infinitely. With that, you still get access to each individual part, so I'm pulling down there and kind of accessing you can make them lit, unlit materials. We read the SVGs and take the color, for example, directly from them. And then we create materials for you that are dynamic materials. So we don't import hundreds of things into the content browser. Um, and you can see you can add bevels and extrudes and that kind of thing to each one of those. And then you can animate them as well inside of Sequencer. I don't show, showcase it here in this example, but you still have all the independent parts and then can change and put any custom materials on them and override if you want. So a lot of power in, in those kinds of features. Here you can see we're playing around a little bit with our um, modifier system. So the panel that's there, you can see uh, we have different um, extrudes, outlines, bevels. We actually have like an array and clone that's inside there that we call the pattern. Um, we have a mirror modifier, so I'm mirroring this on the left and the right. I'm able to take those in, and it's just fun to be able to play with these kinds of things fully live. We even have things like bend and taper and some deformers that are in there as well. So next yeah. up, David's gonna tell us a little bit about the material designer. Yeah, so the material designer, uh, Building materials in Unreal Engine for people who come from other industries that are more accommodating of like Photoshop and all those kinds of layer-based uh, material systems, or layer-based just design systems. Um, when they come to Unreal, it's like, what's going on here? So what we've kind of done is we've tried to create a system where you guys can kind of layer up and build kind of custom designs in a format in a design system that's a bit more familiar. So what we've got here is we have a 2D element that we brought in, this character, and we've got this cool background that's kind of chilling back there. And let's say we just want to layer that up. We can move that to the background. It can hang out back there. We can reorder these layers. We can adjust their opacity. In this case, we're adjusting some of the transforms to kind of move these properties around, move these elements around on the screen. And we're gonna add kind of a little effect here. And what's nice is we have this system of blend modes that should be super familiar to anybody who's kind of used you know, any of the major kind of uh, image composition programs, compositing programs. In this case, we're gonna go ahead and add that back there, that glow, and we're gonna get, have it be an add to kind of make things glow a little bit. And we have kind of a global opacity slider here that'll kind of let you kind of do that to every element at the same time, or each individual element as we're trying to show in here. All of this is keyframable, as you'd expect. And so as we kind of move forward here, this kind of psych that's in the background, we're also able to move that with the offset controls because we have full kind of UV animation controls that you can keyframe. 
So again, give this whole thing some depth, give it a background, have that background move, all the kind of ex effects you'd expect from being able to do this kind of stuff in a typical kind of 2D kind of compositor. So we kind of, yeah, that's kind of what we have going on there. And all of this, what's really cool about it is as you're building it up in this system, it's not just living here and it's done. This is actually building a real Unreal material that is a whole lot more nodes than what we're showing there. And that's kind of what you're able to at any point flip this button over and see what this is actually doing in the background. And you could take that material, copy it over, and actually use it as a proper Unreal material. And this, so this kind of gives you a nice jump start, if you will. Uh, it saves you a bunch of time and also kind of lets people onboard into our system pretty quickly. Yeah, so that's a lot of kind of where we were at throughout the year in April. Now I'm going to show you more of the progress of since then. So um, the big change is now that this is just a mode of the engine. It's a motion graphics mode. So you can engage with all the other kinds of modes that you're used to, the landscape mode um, and the world building modes that you're typically used to. So the modeling tools and all that kind of stuff. So now we've transitioned to just be in the level editor full time. Uh, you can see here, this is an example I made with the twin motion watch, um, the ability to be able to use the camera cut system and bring all these things in. You can see I get the volumetric light. In the background, I have a small cloner system like I was showing just to scatter some of these things. They're actually just small, tiny spheres. And then the watch face itself is actually the internal geometry tools that I was just showing you. So I just made one of those um, cylinders and I rotated it around and animated it. And the cool part is, you know, typically you're doing this in two or three applications. And now, because this is all native and built in, you can stay in that creative flow very easily. So going back to the, the meshes, for example, and just changing, you know, the offsets of these, if someone gives you notes, you don't have to go back and re-render things and send it back and forth. It's just a very nice, easy way to work. So, um, yeah, we think and we're very excited in the next version of the beta. This is kind of what we're pushing out to the community and excited to see where people go and where people take it. So a little bit more on the cloners and effectors. So the cloner system under the hood is built by our Niagara particle system. So the cool part is we can start to add forces. So I'm making a cylinder here. I'm kind of scattering them and adding some randomization to that. And as you saw, I was moving those effectors through. But now we can actually just start to add forces to those as well. So we can add curl noise, for example, and just get some of that undulation and things like that very easily. So again, this is fully live. You can go ahead and nest other objects inside of it, and it would replace those uh, particles. But we're starting to add all kinds of uh, forces. So I'll show you in this example here, we have the ability to take like a whole system and just add some movement, some orientation to it. We have the ability to turn on the um, overall like per clone rotation and you can change those. Uh, and then we're uh, adding the curl noise in there as well. The things we're looking at next is some of the gravity forces and the other things that come with, um, you know, the dynamics and the physics side of Niagara. And so, uh, you know, as of this week, we've been able to get some of those things in where you can move those effectors through and it starts to add those forces where those effectors hit. So it's just a, a very cool, creative uh, process. Here is showing you on those, we've added the ability to clone those along the splines. So you can see these little tread marks here, for example. Uh, you can see in the viewport, there's a whole series of splines. So designers like to work this way because it's very procedural. You can move those around. You can have those things follow and obviously kind of art direct them to your heart's content. So you can see uh, in this example the ability to uh, just clone those things along the splines and then have them reveal on. And then lastly as well, we've added the ability to um, use texture maps. So you can see here's a massive grid of clones. Uh, and you have the ability to say, hey, let's mask those to a texture. So it's just a white and black texture that we had from our Rocket League session. And you can see here now we're getting to get some of that reveal coming across with, with using texture maps. So obviously we'll continue to take this further, but it's starting to become a very solid base for design. Um, next up, in viewport editing, uh, we've added the ability for you to, f anything that you use in the details panel as you favorite can show up inside of the viewport. So you can see here, I take an HDRI, 
I've added that in, um, and now I can basically not have to go back to the details panel, but I can edit things in context very easily. So I'm changing, you know, just some of these settings. The cool part is, you know, if you do this for a spotlight, all the spotlights can show up that way, um, and you can move these about. So in a second here, you'll see in the, the bottom left corner, um, you can drag these around, you can dock them, you can snap them together, and so it just makes for a very artist-friendly workflow. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit quickly about text and font features. Everyone's most exciting topic, I know. So what you're able to do now is you can browse system fonts, you can browse project fonts, you can kind of, like, it, it, the whole system's kind of open to you, literally. Just grab fonts wherever you need to. Uh, you can preview all that stuff before you even import it to save you that little bit of time. We have a bunch of font styling tools that we're going to show in a second here. Let's get to those. We're still switching fonts, and that's completely exciting but powerful. So once, you've, once you're kind of in there, you can switch between the various font types, so bold, italic, all that good stuff, all the stuff you'd want from fonts. Um, so once you're in there, let's get through that part. We're gonna get to some font styling in a moment here, I promise. So any of these fonts are able to be 2D or 3D. They can be extruded, beveled, and you can apply different materials to their various faces like you would be able to in any kind of 3D program. And so that's all for fonts. <laughs> so materials, um, in the beta, you know, people have asked us a bit about, you know, what, are, what do you guys want to do with materials? Obviously we have the Quixel library. We have some very specific needs around materials and the masking and the items we're showing we're using transparency in some very specific ways. So we're starting to think through and uh, want to provide a small library of elements that would get you started uh, quicker, faster, better for the 3D. We showed you some of the 2D and, and 2D material creation side of things. Um, but look out for this. This is something that we're starting to put a little bit of focus in within our team. Yep. I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the animation um, improvements. So we've added a thing that we call animators. Animators, uh, you can target any specific property. So this isn't the final UX that, you know, we're still in beta, so we're trying to figure some of this out, but you can go ahead and say, hey, I wanna add a wiggle to the X and Y values here, and I'm gonna go ahead and change the strength of these. So you can start to see it's building up that animation, and now we can go ahead and start to add that per character. So, you know, I'm starting to crank the values and go nuts on these. But this can be targeted to any property. So I'm using text, but it could be spotlights, for example. So kind of like a cooking show, I'm gonna go ahead and turn on a couple of the spotlights, and now I'm getting some roaming, wiggling position of those. Um, <clears throat> and so, so far, we've tackled some of the basics. We're gonna have like the wiggles, the bounce, the randoms, those kinds of things. Um, but we'd love to talk with you and see what you know, where you'd like us to go next. Obviously we have a list, but we should compare notes um, after the talk if you want. So the next step is to do something with a bounce. Um, so this is kind of like a text effect, if you will, where you can add a, a bounce to the Z. So I'm gonna go ahead and crank the values a little bit, and you can see it's the whole word, but now I need to do a little bit of range selection, and you can see I'm starting to get like that bounce animation. So these again are those hallmarks of motion graphics, the ability to be able to you know, obviously we see this stuff all day, every day on, on uh, the kind of content you watch on TV and, and online. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a fun feature, and we'd love to collaborate with you guys on that. So rigging and templating, everyone here who's in the broadcast industry would know that's a pretty core part of what we do. These graphics need to be kind of set up for, so we're successful on the road, right? We can quickly type things in. So what we've kind of got going here is our system that we had built for the ESPYs and helped to build with that, where you're able to kind of go in and you can change color scheme based on this property up here. It'll go from the various spots and change the text. And along with that text, it's going to expand the bar. So as you can see on the kind of top, top line there, it will expand and contract with the size of the text. So all this will auto size, that's what the actual tool is called. And as you do the same thing with the main bar, same thing's going to happen there. As you add a line two, we kind of have it so that it'll automatically expand the height as well. So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty active design that we're able to accommodate here that we're pretty used to at this point in this industry. And the cool part about this is you don't have to code these things. This yeah. is all part of our layout modifier yeah. system. 
which we didn't dive into too much detail to show here, but it's very, in the same way, designer friendly of being able to, but we do show a little bit of that in the, the coming slides, so. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, on this one, <clears throat> so this is a little dive deep. Uh, you can see here that we can target any property. So we're gonna go ahead and change a bunch of colors. Um, you know, across that we have 10 different colors we need to control at once. For someone who's an operator, they just want one place where they can change all of those things. So there, we have the ability to link those up, which David will show a little bit next. Um, you can see that you can auto size that content so that the bars end up fitting correctly. It's important for these designs and for templating that, you know, you need to be able to type any text in there and you don't want it to be able to bump into the guy's shoulder, for example. So you need to max size those things to fit. And so you can see that we have a lot of tools built in there that are very artist friendly. In this example here, you can see oftentimes you build one layout that needs to have multiple purposes. So you build layouts that have two, three, four options into them, or it could be a video box, or it could be sponsor on the left, sponsor on the right. Um, and these are all done with our remote control and the rigging logic that we're showing you. So we're using like our modifier system there. We have a grid arrange and that allows you to change how many rows are visible to the user. So, you know, you could change this anywhere from five to 10 rows of text, for example. <clears throat> and then we'll be showing more of this, but this is our playlist tool. And we even designed all the lower thirds that were for the, these demo videos inside of this system. So this is intended to be able to play out all that content live, and then as you can see, each one of those graphics becomes a template that you can then version and play. Yep. So what we've kind of showing here is our, we basically have a equivalent of a field ID system going on, where we are able to take multiple properties. In this case, we're going to be setting a texture, color, and some text and you can assign those to a property ID slash field ID. We haven't settled fully on a name yet, but we'll let you guys know as soon as we have one. So as you kind of go through here, uh, we have a conditional uh, behavior happening where you know, if you set it to one, let me give me some uh, red background on all of my elements here, and then set the texture accordingly, and then set the text to something. In this case, it's this is a red headline, panic. So we're gonna be doing this for each of these each numbers that we're gonna be setting down here. One, two, and three are going to give us different results. This is a super kind of common need to be able to set things according to like an integer in this case. Uh, so yeah. Now, all this kind of leads into something we've been asked about many times, which is when are we going to have a system to do a sort of transition, live transition between graphics and be able to keep certain graphics on the screen take certain graphics off the screen, and to kind of assign everything to layers, so you can go ahead and advance it. So, what we're working with here, I'm gonna play this thing out, and we've got a lower third. That lower third has a very specific job, and we're going to tell what that job is using the system. In this transition layer, we have preset groups that we can, you can assign however you want. In this case, we have one called L3. We're gonna take this graphic, we're gonna assign it to that group, and we have a whole state tree system that we'll go into in more detail at a later time, because it's a lot to talk about right now. But the point is that graphic has now been assigned as a lower third, system knows it is that, and so forth. We're gonna make another graphic here and assign that graphic to an, basically an upper left, or upper right rather. And so we're gonna go in, assign it to a slab, and there you go. Once you've done that, you can go to, we're gonna do one more scene. This will all coalesce, don't you worry. We're gonna have a widget that's gonna be an upper left. In this case, it's handling like a locator. And we're gonna do the same thing. Go ahead and assign it. And once it's all assigned, and rigged, obviously. Skip that part, but you know, that's, it. that's a, just a minor detail. Then we can go into our playlist tool. And from the playlist, we're able to kind of play those things out and preview them like you'd expect. And then we're eventually going to be able to take them to air. But right now, let's preview this lower third and check it out. We're gonna pick one more. There it is. And it's gonna bring in a slab, upper right, and upper left, so we got our locator there. And now, let's flip this thing over and take a look at the play out and see how this would all look. So, White House, right? Got a graphic coming in, lower third, okay, great. That's on its own layer. It can come and go as it pleases. We have our upper right that's got a whole other thing, and our locator on the upper left. We can now, because we've assigned things, switch that lower third to a totally different lower third with nothing else being affected by that, 
and bring in a different lower third, change the upper right, upper left, and then just kind of go from there. And then take everything out at the same time or take everything out individually. In this case, we chose to take it all at the same time. So yeah. Yeah, so key to that is the playlist tool, which yep. we've been prototyping for the broadcast side of things. And with this, we're working with a whole series of partners as well on the, the broadcast industry. As many people know, we have a lot of partnerships on that side of things. So we've been developing this out, and we actually have run a couple shows with this playlist tool now. But you can get program preview. There's key and fill uh, graphics. As David was showing, there's multi-layer output for those. You have the ability to template those pages and change the values with remote control. And as I was mentioning, we have a pretty rich API. So if you're in that space where you develop applications that want to control Unreal, come see us and we'd love to chat with you. So last bit, uh, data integrations. Uh, one thing, you know, here's a quick example, just showcasing how you can take something and get like uh, data from an Excel spreadsheet into Unreal. So. Obviously, Unreal, the things that we've been doing, it goes pretty far, but in this example, we're using the remote control to plot you know, where the hurricane path is gonna be and some of those spline tools. So all of the actual shapes and things like that in this very um, kind of cartoony example is built up through that suite of the geometry tools I was showing you, and then the ability to change those values but ingest things through that remote API that allows you to pull in those data sources. So last thing, uh, I think feature-wise, we're gonna talk about is a feature we call StormSync. So in this example here, this again, it might be a little bit of inside baseball, but um, oftentimes in that broadcast industry, you need the ability to have machines that are off, uh, offline, they don't have internet access, and you need to be able to share the files between them. So we have the ability to pack these files into what we call an SPAC file, and what it will do is it will go ahead and condense all those files into like a zipped file that you can then share amongst projects. So I could say, hey David, I finished the scene, let me send it to you, you could be in a different location. Uh, you can take that SPEC file, so I'm opening a different project here. I drag and drop that into the content browser and it will unpack that and make the exact same content folder structure that I have. There's actually a unique hash to it, so it keeps track of the individual elements. So if all I updated was you know, the animation and the level, we don't need to send all the texture data, we don't need to send all the geometry data, we can just send that element along and it will slide in nicely. So it's not 100% of a uh, source control replacement, such as Perforce, but the ability to take those elements and kind of share them amongst artists uh, in an easy way where you have access to all those is, is what we've done. So yeah, uh, to kind of wrap things up a little bit here, so roadmap and timeline, just kind of showcasing, obviously we covered a lot of features. We've been working on this since the 5.2 from uh, a few years ago. And so 5.3 is out now, and you can kind of see there. Um, but right now, the plan of record is to ship this in the 5.4 timeline, which will be out uh, around GDC timeframe next year. So we're working on many of those elements that I have listed there now with the scene transitions and the state manager and some of the masking animators, modifier system, those kinds of things. So we're getting close to a near release, but if you're interested in the beta, and especially if you work for a big uh, media company and are excited to test out these tools, come, come find us after this and we'll, we'll link you up. Yep. Um, but yeah, we'd love to hear your guys' feedback. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much.